delighted to welcome you to this research session at convention. We are calling this um, HD Science 101. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I have the great pleasure of introducing four um, incredible scientists who have been supported through HDSA's Berman Topper uh, Career Development Fellowship. Um, these, these four women are, are not only committed to making HD science a major part of their careers, um, but they are also all excellent science communicators. They're going to be talking about the basics of HD research. So if you're looking to become more comfortable with the ins and outs of HD research and uh, learn a little bit more, maybe you're, you're new to research and this is a great place for you to be. Um, I'm mostly going to let them introduce themselves, but I will just say briefly that uh, Dr. Addis Mendezabal is a neurologist and researcher at UCLA studying the prevalence of HD in minoritized populations. Dr. Lauren Byrne is soon to be faculty at University College London, and she is studying biomarkers with a focus on juvenile HD. Um, Dr. Rachel Harding is a researcher at the University of Toronto, and she studies the structure of Huntington protein and how it interacts with other molecules in our cells. And Dr. Sarah Hernandez is at UC Irvine, where she works with human cells to help define uh, changes caused by HD and figure out ways to intervene. Um, I will remind you now that um, none of the info here is shared, uh, shared here is meant as medical advice. Um, we'll also ask you all to keep your masks on your beautiful faces. Um, and hello to everybody who is attending at home. Um, and I think that's about it. So I will hand it over to our speakers. Great, thanks so much, Leora. Um, it's wonderful to be here with you all. Uh, we're so excited to be able to present to you, some of you in person, some of you virtually. Um, yeah, if you have questions, I think uh, you need to put them into the app and Leora is gonna be fielding questions to us later once we finish the presentation. So yeah, just to, just to reinforce the idea, this is an informational session. Um, I myself am definitely not a medical doctor. I'm a, a useless science doctor, could not do anything for you in an emergency, unfortunately. But this is an informational session just to teach you and hopefully you know, build on your knowledge about Huntington's disease. And yeah, just a reminder for everyone to keep their masks on as much as possible, please. Okay. So for this session, we wanted to go right the way back um, to really some of the basics of Huntington's disease biology. And that all kind of really starts with the history of Huntington's disease. Many of you will know that Huntington's is named after this uh, rather handsome fellow on the slide called George Huntington. And he wrote this very seminal paper all the way back in 1872 describing this inherited condition that we now know is Huntington's disease. Um, but in between that time, all the way through, like over a century later in 1993, was when we finally mapped exactly what was going on on the genetic level of Huntington's disease. Um, and there's this really important paper that was published by this consortium of scientists, people working all over the world to really try and track down what was going on at the genetic level of people with Huntington's. Um, and that was done uh, quite a few years ago, nearly 30, 30 years ago now. That's where I realized I'm getting a lot older. 1993 was actually quite a long time ago. Um, yeah, so to Huntington's has always been very interesting to scientists, um, mainly because of the way that it's inherited, which is quite unusual compared to other genetic illnesses. So you'll often hear Huntington's being referred to as autosomal dominant. So what does that mean? So often when you have a genetic illness, um, it means that you would have inherited um, a copy of the, the gene that's gone a little bit wonky from one copy from your mum and one copy from your dad. But Huntington's is very different. You actually only need one copy of the Huntington's disease gene um, to mean that you yourself will have Huntington's disease. So in the example that I have here on the slides, the dad doesn't have Huntington's, but the mum carries the Huntington's disease gene and she passes it on to their child. Each child from uh, these parents will have a 50-50 chance of inheriting Huntington's disease from them. And most of you will know and understand this in the way that it affects Huntington's disease families. But what does this all mean? So one of the sort of dogmatic things that we talk a lot about in science and especially in biochemistry is like, well, you have this in your gene, but what does that actually really mean in terms of your biology? So um, our Huntington gene, that's, that's a mutation that happens at the level of our DNA. 
And each gene encodes a recipe um, to make a message molecule, which we also call RNA. The message molecules are the molecules that we heard about earlier today that are being targeted by all these different drugs, like the splicing modulators, like Branaplam, um, but also the antisense oligonucleotide drugs that WAVE and people are making. And this message molecule is basically a molecular recipe for how to make specific protein molecules. And in this case, the Huntington gene makes the Huntington message, which makes the Huntington protein. Um, so there's lots of Huntington words going on. And as Jeff mentioned earlier, we're not very good at coming up with interesting names to rename things. So they're all called the same thing. But the underlying principles of Huntington's disease is that if you have an unexpanded form of the gene, you'll make a normal Huntington protein that can work really well, and you'll have healthy nerve cells that are doing all the things that they're meant to be doing in your brain and in your body. But if you make an expanded form of the Huntington gene, you will also make an expanded form of the protein. So that protein molecule looks a little bit different, and it's not quite working in the same way. And people who are making the expanded form of the Huntington protein are folks who will have Huntington's disease. And so there's sort of lots of different cutoffs that people use, but generally it can be said that if you have an expansion, which means you have a CAG number above 35, um, you will probably have Huntington's disease at some point in your life. And so one of the big questions in Huntington's disease biology is to try and understand what's going on at the protein level. And this is something that, as Laura, Laura mentioned, like that's something that I'm studying in the lab. And so what we do is we take the unexpanded version of the Huntington protein and then compare it to the expanded version. And then we all use all kinds of um, tricks to really zoom in at the molecular level to try and work out what's different between these two forms of the protein. And nowadays we're super lucky because not only is Huntington's disease research really blossoming and we're finding out so much more about the biology, there's all this cutting edge technology that's becoming available to scientists to try and answer their specific biological questions. One of which is we can use these now super powerful microscopes. This one's called a Titan Cryos because uh, the more important and expensive your microscope is, the better the name has to be. And these microscopes are really incredible. They can see a single molecule of a protein. So this uh, image on the right-hand side of the slide is looking, each one of those little dots is a single molecule of protein, which is nanoscopically small. So this is absolutely incredible. And what we've been able to do is to use this technology to really understand what the Huntington protein looks like. And so we started off with this idea of this big blobby protein, and then we start to get more and more information. And now with these amazing microscopes, um, we have this really detailed model. And actually, I'm going to pass around. I have some three-dimensionally printed mo uh, models of the Huntington protein um, so that you can have a look at it yourself. Hang on. Give me a sec. Yeah, so this was a really big breakthrough back in 2018, and we're slowly mo learning more and more about these different um, understandings of the Huntington protein. And this is important because the more we know about what a molecule looks like, the more we can understand about what it's actually doing. Why is the Huntington protein so important for why our nerve cells function? And what we know so far is that actually it's probably not very simple at all. It's probably incredibly complicated. Um, and the Huntington protein is often likened to being a Swiss army knife where it has all these different jobs and could do all these different things in cells in our body. And to study all these different functions, we need different model systems and tools to look at HD. And so Sarah is going to introduce you to some of those different concepts now. Okay, so as Rachel mentioned, we have kind of the molecular understanding of what's causing Huntington's, but to study Huntington's in the lab, we use various tools. And one of those tools that we use are different animals, so model systems. And this is literally a definition I got off of Wikipedia, so feel free to read it. But a model organism is basically a non-human system, a non-human species that is modified in some way so that you can study a scientific question you're interested in. And so for Huntington's, what we do is we modulate these organisms at the genetic level to contain either the expanded, the unexpanded Huntington, or both. And that allows us to study Huntington's. And there are various models that are frequently used in labs. Um, so Rachel mentioned there's the Huntington protein solo. What we can do is add that to a tube. We can ask questions like, what is this protein binding to? Um, what is this protein doing in conjunction with something else? But if you want to ask larger questions, you can use different model systems. And um, HD researchers have created Huntington's models for a variety of different organisms. So there are fruit flies that have Huntington's. There are tiny worms called C. elegans. There's even yeast that has Huntington's. 
And there are um, questions you can ask by looking at cells in a dish. So scientists have taken cells from Huntington's patients and put them in a dish so that we can use cells from a human and model the disease. A lot of people are probably familiar with mice that are used for HD studies. There are also rats. And then there's higher order organisms, so things like sheep and pigs. And at the very top, before you get to humans and do things like clinical trials, people, people can also study non-human primates, so monkeys. And you might be looking at some of these things and asking yourself, like, what do I have in common with some of this, right? Like, how familiar do you feel with a fruit fly, right? Like, you probably feel quite different. Uh, but surprisingly, there's a lot in common between even a fruit fly and a human. 50% of your DNA is similar to a fruit fly. And so there are also central nervous system in a fruit fly. It has a fully functioning brain that scientists can even dissect out and ask pretty complex questions about the disease. And there are other organisms that are even more similar. So 99% of DNA between humans and mice is similar. And you can start asking really complex, sophisticated questions about this disease without actually studying in humans before you go on to humans. But choosing a model system, scientists really have to think about the questions that they want to ask and answer. Um, so if you want to understand how Huntington's is affecting perhaps a neuron and how that might be communicating differently with cells in the brain, you wouldn't pick the Huntington protein and put it in a test tube. That wouldn't help you answer those questions. Um, and conversely, if you want to know how the Huntington protein is binding to something, you would do that more quickly if you just looked at the protein in a tube. And so asking the right type of questions before you start your experiment and choosing the right model system can really be a huge advantage. And so there are various things that scientists have to think about. Um, so for example, if you have a very small lab, if you're a new faculty and they're not giving you much space, you might not want to start a primate lab. You will probably want to work with fruit flies first or something like that. Um, cost can also be a concern. If you have a smaller grant, you want to consider what you can get done in a certain, with a certain budget. And then also the lifespan of an organism. If you have a six-month grant, uh, you're definitely not going to want to choose a primate or a sheep or a pig that can take 10 to 15 years to even to start to show symptoms. Um, you would want to choose something that would get sick much more quickly. Um, and so one of the organisms or one of the model systems that I use in lab are stem cells. And so what defines a stem cell is really two characteristics. The first is that it can self-divide, replicate, and form its own self again. And then the second is that it can, what we do call differentiate. So it turns itself into a terminally differentiated cell of a different lineage. So something like a blood cell or a fat cell or even a brain cell. And um, at least at one point, what people most commonly thought of when they thought of stem cells were embryonic stem cells. And these are cells that come from the inner cell mass of an embryo, but there are actually a variety of different types of stem cells that people can work with. Another one are adult stem cells. These exist in your body and give rise to very specific other types of cells. So for example, there's something called a mesenchymal stem cell in your bone marrow that can't give rise to a neuron or something like that, but can to white blood cells or red blood cells. And then what's most frequently used these days in the lab are induced pluripotent stem cells. And these are derived from typically skin cells and turned into neurons. And that really allows you to take skin cells from a patient and study their brain without ever getting a brain sample from that patient. And so this is a brief video of kind of how this is done. Um, so we have cells that kind of have this kinetic potential to turn into various cells. So for example, skin cells that we can add chemical factors to and force them back up this hill, regaining that kinetic potential and allowing them to be forced down a different lineage. So for example, a heart cell or in the case of Huntington's, a brain cell. And this is what allows us to study brain cells from people that we only got skin cells from. And it's a really powerful tool because once we have these stem cells, we can do all sorts of experiments that are really going to tell us a lot about Huntington's. For example, we can turn these cells into neurons and look at how the development is affected by Huntington's. Um, and so by turning them into neurons and comparing those to cells from someone without Huntington's, we can see does the disease affect something in the way that those cells develop. We can look at different disease mechanisms. So for example, studying how neurons communicate with other cells, or are there factors secreted by those cells that might be changing the environment in which they sit in the brain? And then we can also use stem cells for drug development. Um, and so this little square here is a 96-well plate. 
It's basically a little square um, with deep little wells inside, 96 of them. And you can seed your stem cells in there and put a different drug in each well. And if you're looking for some metric that makes your cells better, you would be able to identify potential drug targets. And we're incredibly lucky in the HD field because we have the HD iPSC consortium. And this is a group of scientists from across the world and the countries highlighted here that have worked together to generate a cell bank of iPSC, so of these um, pluripotent stem cells from control and HD patients uh, with a variety of CAG repeat lengths. Um, so these have come from people without HD, people who have developed Huntington's in their adult life, and then also people who have developed juvenile onset Huntington's. And so they store these in vials. Scientists can order them. Anyone can order them and perform their experiments. Um, and it kind of, it saves a lot of time because it allows scientists to kind of start at the stem cell stage rather than generating those cells themselves. And I'm going to pass it off now to Lauren, who's going to talk about um, moving from model systems into humans. Hi, everybody. I'm not as tall as everybody else. Does this work? OK, cool. So I uh, work in with clinical research and with patients. So um, and this might be something that everybody else relates to quite well in the room, being humans. So I'm going to talk a bit about observational research, which is different from clinical trials and experimental research, which um, Addis will talk to you about in a little bit. Um, so how do we study people that have HD? Um, some of you might already take part in research or have been to the clinic with one of your loved ones who gets has a neurologist that gets them to tap their fingers or stick their tongue out for 10 seconds. Um, this is usually because they're doing the Unified Huntington's Disease Rating Scale, which is our main clinical tool to, to assess how someone progresses with their symptoms of HD. And it's a tool that allows us um, to classify the people that have symptoms that are manifest HD, which you heard about earlier, into these clinical stages. This is all changing, which you know Sarah Tabritzi will talk about tomorrow, but it also kind of highlights why I'm, I'm interested in biomarkers, because clinical tools um, only are useful for people that have symptoms. Um, but you might have heard already that it might be better to prevent THD from happening, so we need to move earlier. And how that's going to happen is potentially through biomarkers, which are just things that can be measured by in someone um, it could be a blood test, could be an MRI, um, something that allows you to, it tells, a, it tells a scientist about something that's happening in the body. It could be a normal biological process, like blood pressure or something like that, or a disease-related process. And the ways we look at this in observational research are through MRI scans, blood tests, which I'm sure, hope, I hope a lot of people are taking part in the blood study um, that CHGI have arranged. Um, could be thinking tests on a computer as well as what's become more popular in HD, um, lumbar punctures or spinal taps. There have been a whole array of observational research studies, which I'm sure some of you have heard of or taken, maybe taken part, of, in, part in. Maybe you're already involved in a role HD. Um, and that's allowed us to gain really useful information about people that carry the Huntington's disease gene. So for example, um, there was a group that combined genetics data from HD patients from the PREDICT HD study and registry study in Europe to form the um, genetic modifiers um, GEM HD consortium. What a genetic modifier is, is based on the idea that, so um, we mentioned earlier that it's the CAG number, the CAG repeat that um, is related to whether someone will get Huntington's disease. So this is quite a common kind of graph where people with longer CAG repeats have uh, tend to have earlier onset of Huntington's disease. However, at these very common repeats of 40 to 50, we see quite a variation in when people get symptoms. That could be anything from 60 years difference of age of onset. So what else is actually contributing to when someone gets a disease? And what scientists have done is look at other parts of the DNA and the genetics that we have to see whether they change or modify how the onset happens. And what interesting thing they did find is that these DNA repair genes, so genes that are involved in keeping our DNA and the, the material that, uh, that builds um, the genetics and the genome in our cells, keeps that healthy and maintained. All, uh, 
a few different genes in that pathway were involved in the onset or affecting the onset of Huntington's disease. So I work with biofluids and biomarkers that can be gained from biofluids like saliva, urine, and particularly blood and CSF or spinal fluid. Um, and Ed and Jeff, if you went to the talk earlier, highlighted mutant Huntington and how important that was for a lot of the Huntington lowering trials. Um, this was done by measuring the mutant Huntington protein, which uh, Rachel just showed you the, the structure of, um, that can be measured in the spinal fluid and has been super important for these clinical trials. Um, I've worked on this in my PhD and my own research and also comparing it to another marker called neurofilament light, which is a protein that can be found in all the brain cells or all the neurons in our, in our brains. Um, and it, um, it gets in, it's increased in our blood and spinal fluid when there's some kind of d damage or um, if our brain cells are sick. And we've seen that these three markers or biomarkers are increased in people that carry the gene as well as people that are pre-manifest, people that carry it before they've got symptoms. And it gets more increased as the disease goes on. And they happen to be changed very early in people that carry the gene. So this is a study, some results on the neurofilament light protein or NFL from a young adult study of people up to the age of, uh, from 18 to 40. And it was the only thing that was different between people that were over 18 years from onset, from their predicted age of onset, was this neurofilament light protein. So their brains were normal, their, they could think and, and everything was psychiatrically normal, um, but there's this tiny change in this, this brain protein that can be measured in the spinal fluid. So it's becoming increasingly important, and this is the marker that the blood study that you've been invited to take part in today is measuring. So if you're really interested, I definitely recommend taking part because it's going to be super important information for the community going forward. And I'll pass over to Addis, who's going to tell you a bit more about clinical trials. All right. Um, so quickly to wrap up, um, we're, we've kind of walked slowly through the history of HD, the different models that we use to study HD, biomarkers. And then the next question is, how do we develop medications for HD? Um, so, you know, there's two types of research studies um, that we do in the clinical work. Um, so Lauren was just talking about a lot of observational studies. Um, it pretty much idea of observational study is that we want to know how a disease, like understand the disease and how it impacts patients. So my work um, is actually looking at health disparities and then trying to understand how patients access care, what are the barriers for HD patients to get into a clinician, are the disparities based on where you live, based on your race, ethnicity, and then also the question of cost, you know, insurance, how, you know, are there barriers for certain patients with um, certain insurance and different issues based on their level of income. Um, I am not related to the study, but a quick plug by some of the folks from CHDI. Um, if you have about you know, eight minutes, they are doing a survey looking at these questions in terms of cost and access um, for HD. They're in the elevator. They asked me really quickly to put in a little plug for them, but also helps me because that's kind of you know, my area of research. All right, so now moving on to experimental studies, and that's how we're going to wrap up today's talk. Um, so experimental studies, um, it's... You know, I think for most of us here, that's what we think of when we're thinking of a drug trial or a clinical trial. So pretty much what they do is that they're helping us know whether a medication works or if it doesn't. And it doesn't always have to be a medication. It could also be some form of treatment. So if we talk about physical therapy, a different type of exercise, a new routine, or in mental health services, if there's a different type of you know, motivational interviewing or a different type of therapy that's provided, seeing if it's better than the usual care um, for patients with Huntington's disease. So now getting to how do we get from all of this knowledge to coming up with the drug, right? So coming up with a pill that your doctor is able to prescribe, you go to a pharmacy, pick it up, and then hopefully your symptoms are getting better, or with a goal for HD, either the disease slows down or you know, we kind of stop the progression. So, so far we've talked from you know, kind of the drug discovery, that is what you know, the wonderful women are looking into. Um, 
it's what are the drugs that are working um, with what models. You know, we started looking at, you know, we can use mice, but we can talk about all the different models that Sarah um, you know, mentioned earlier. And then once we find a drug that potentially works, then the next step is the preclinical development. So how do we get that molecule to a pill that you could take? Or you know, if it's gonna be something that is injected into your spine, like how can we create all of that um, to make sure that you know, it can get to the human, which is kind of where we're gonna spend the rest of the talk. So now I'm gonna be chatting about clinical trials, what are the phases and some of the terminology that you'll be seeing kind of as you get more interested on um, clinical trials for HD. So this is a bit of the drug pipeline. Um, and there's four phases, but I'm gonna focus on three and briefly talk on the fourth one. So the three phases of clinical trials, um, phase one, how I like to kind of summarize it is, is trying to ask a question, is the drug safe? So you start with a small number of patients, 20 to 50, and then you see if there's any major side effects. You know, number one rule of medicine, do no harm. So that's the first thing that we wanna make sure, that there, we're, whatever drug that we saw that in the mouse model or any other animal model that it actually works, that when a human takes it, it's not gonna cause harm. So let's say that there's no harm, great. Then the next question is, does the drug actually work? Um, so in this one, we move into what is called a phase two study. Um, it's a larger study, about 50 to 200 patients. Um, some of the trials that we were chatting about earlier um, this morning, they were already have made it to a phase two. So in that one is, you know, is the medication actually working? So um, as you, many of you may remember, we talked about wave three. In that one, the medication was not working. But then the next question we wanna ask there too is, are we seeing side effects? Is it causing harm? So when we talk about Generation HD1, the Roche trial, that was one of the concerns, that it was causing harm. So if it's not causing harm, we know the medication is working, then we move into phase three. So this one is saying, okay, we think it works, but are we sure? And the only way that we can be really sure is if we look at larger numbers of patients. So now we're talking about 200, 1,000. And again, we're always checking for any sort of side effects, any sort of um, um, you know, adverse events or anything like that. And then let's say that that's fine, right? So it works, there's no major side effects. Then we get into what is called here in the US, you know, FDA approvals. So then that means that once the FDA approves the medication, then a doctor can prescribe the medication, you go to the pharmacy, you can pick it up. Now, there is a phase four that we don't really talk a lot about, um, but in phase four is the more monitoring. So the medication got approved, you can go and pick it up from the, um, the pharmacy, but then over time, they continue to check that we don't find any new problems, that we're not identifying a certain group of patients that are having specific side effects, that in, you know, we may say, okay, this medication actually now is causing more harm. I think um, in terms of HD medications, one example may be tetrabenacin, which is a medication used for Korea. You know, it was FDA approved, great, but then over time they noticed that in some patients there was a higher risk of suicidal ideation. So then it has what is called a black box warning. So us as clinicians, now we know, okay, if we're thinking of giving this medication to one of, my H of our HD patients, we have to screen for things like depression, anxiety, make sure that we counsel the family, the patient, and that we pay a close attention to knowing that there's an increased risk for this particular patient, um, group of patients. And then, you know, again, more recommendations happen along the time, you know, along um, the road, and rarely, um, you know, if we start noticing that the medication is actually causing a lot of harm, then a medication can get recalled. Um, hasn't happened in the Huntington's community with our medications. Um, you know, I think it's something that, for example, in the 50s, medication for nausea and pregnancy found to have a lot of side effects, you know, for the fetus, and, you know, you take out the medication from the market. So a little bit in terms of some terminology and some for, um, terms that you may see. So there's a term randomized control trial. Um, so pretty much what this does is that it's kind of reducing bias. So the idea is, you know, we think this medication works, but how can we always be certain that it's actually working? Um, so in this case, you know, and this is all the drug trials, what they do is that they compare participants that get the drug to those that do not get the drug. And if those that got the drug are doing better, then we know that the medication or the intervention works. 
Then another term that you'll see is placebo, um, also like called like a, you know, the sugar pills or, um, you know, it's, it, the idea is that this is a compound, you know, it may look like the actual pill, it looks like the drug, but it actually doesn't have the active ingredient. And it's very important that we have patients that are also getting the placebo, the one that doesn't have the active drug, because as, as, as I said, that's the only way that we can know that the drug is working. You know, we need to compare who gets the actual drug to who doesn't. Another term you may see is open label extensions. So in phase three trials, um, so looking here, right? So the medication gets approved phase three. Um, usually in this phase three, we're talking about a group that had a, the drug and the gr a group that didn't. So in a phase three extension, everyone gets the drug and then they just continue to be monitored over time. Blinding is another term that you may see. Um, so that means that there's someone or multiple people in the study that do not know if you got the drug or if you didn't. Um, in most clinical trials, the patient doesn't know if they had the drug or not, the doctor doesn't know, the research coordinators don't know. Um, you know, it's pretty much one person, you know, back, you know, within the um, industry or pharmaceutical company that will know, okay, this number actually meant drug and this other number was, you know, um, placebo. Eligibility criteria, they differ. Um, it's looking at what is the patient that the study is specifically trying to, um, you know, um, the medication is trying to target or trying to help. Um, what, you know, some of the things that um, we were chatting earlier, like, as Lauren was mentioning, is that some of the eligibility for a lot of the current trials is when the disease already happened. So how can we get, you know, to biomarkers and other um, ways of getting patients to be part of the trial before they have symptoms? And then the last thing that you'll already heard about is the drug safety board. So they review the data every couple of months to make sure that the drug is helping and not causing harm. I won't go at length into this. All to say is that there's a lot of medications on the pipeline for Huntington's disease. Um, you know, I think as Louise mentioned earlier, the word hope. So I think there's a lot of hope you know, when we look at this, um, these images. And you have an idea here of how far along are the different trials. Um, and again, even when we have setbacks, you know, we can look, um, I don't know if you can see the pointer, probably, oh, here we go, there's a pointer. Um, if you look here, like Roche, the Roche trial, you know, it was a phase two before it moved back, but that just means that, you know, they haven't given up, right? So they're just, thinking who is the right patient that we should be delivering this medication for. And then just to wrap up, the question then is, how do you get involved in clinical trials? So I'll share two of my recommended websites. So one is clinicaltrials.gov. Um, so this is a website in which you can find all of the clinical trials that are happening, not only through in the US, but also in other countries. You type Huntington's disease, you can include more specific data in terms of your state, city, put in how many miles from you, and you can see if they're recruiting um, or not. Um, one benefit, you see everything that's happening, but the downside is that it's not necessarily specific to you. So you do have to kind of reach out to each one of the sites to say, you know, to find out if you're eligible or not, although they do have that information there. A little bit easier is HDSA trial finder. So here, um, you can see all the trials as well, but then you also have the opportunity to look into match the trials. So here, you create a profile, and you put in information in terms of your diagnosis, disease stage, and treatment history, and then it pairs you up with specific trials that you may be el eligible for. And I think that is a whirlwind tour through <laughs> Research 101. I'll leave it up for questions. So thank you all. We have lots of time for questions, and I'm getting some in the app. If you go into your app under the agenda, you'll be able to find this session, and you can type questions in. Um, I'm not sure if we can, for the folks at home, change the direction of the camera to the panel, or if we should have everyone come. OK. So I'm getting the thumbs up sign. <clears throat> Uh, we're not taking questions from the floor, but you can type them. Everyone in this room can type them in through the app as well. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> <coughs>
been talking a lot this convention. So the first question that I'm going to pose from our Q&A is uh, perhaps for Rachel, who started us off. Um, but really, I know that all of these wonderful scientists can answer all of these questions. Uh, and I'll take my mask off, too. Do people who have inherited the bad Huntington gene start making the bad Huntington protein at birth or not until later? And can you explain the reason for the delay in onset of symptoms? That's a great question. Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, yeah, so uh, just to kind of recap, uh, like everyone in this room will have two copies of the Huntington gene. Uh, people with Huntington's disease will have an expanded form of the Huntington gene and an unexpanded form. Um, and we make protein from both of these. So we would know that if you looked at my protein, you'd see two unexpanded copies of the Huntington gene. Making un Both would be making unexpanded Huntington. Uh, but for people with Huntington's disease, they'll be making the unexpanded and the expanded. And that starts right at the very beginning. Um, and why there's a delay in seeing symptoms, even though you are making the expanded form of Huntington from the very beginning, is an excellent question that lots of people are trying to answer. Um, and it's like, yeah, something that a lot of people are thinking about. Like, why is there this age of onset that comes much later on? Like, what is it about aging that means that you suddenly start to see symptoms of Huntington's? Um, yeah, and I think right now, I think it'd be fair to say that we're not entirely sure what the answer is, but there's lots of different studies going on to try and understand why some people get it earlier, some people get it later. Lauren talks about um, the GEMHD study and these genome-wide association studies to say why someone who has a CAG number of 42, for example, some people will get symptoms in their 30s, others not till much, much later. So why is that? Um, and there are lots of different clues that it seems to be something to do with a process called DNA damage repair, which is how our cells maintain the DNA in our bodies. But there's still a lot of work to try and unpick that to give more precise answers. Um, we also know that um, there's relationships between how long the CAG repeat is and different ways the hunting, mutant Huntington behaves. So um, there's an idea that um, when the CAG repeat or it's expanded, the protein's extra sticky and aggregates, and there's you know theories that that happen so that, that kind of process happens more and more with age so there's a certain kind of kinetics to aggregation and things sticking together so that's one thing that could be age related there's another thing i didn't get time to add a slide about which is called somatic instability which is quite a hot topic at the minute and we didn't touch on um so there's this idea that so we all the the dna and our ge genetics is in every cell in our body so we all have the same genetic material and, it, and instructions to make the, the proteins and stuff in our cells. Um, so when you get your blood test for your CAG repeat, you get your, you've got 42 repeats, you're going to get Huntington's. What researchers have found over the years is that certain tissues in the body sometimes have higher numbers of CAG repeats in their tissues. So for some reason or other, parts of the brain that are affected the most in Huntington's may have much more, have higher expansions. And that's, that's what somatic expansion means or somatic instability is that this CAG repeat is in unstable for some reason and that it can get, it can increase in length in different cell types. This is all very much unknown why certain cell types are affected in tissues, but it it's something that also can increase with age. Um, so there's these kind of th like hints that are kind of steering us towards this kind of stuff. So we don't know, but there's lots of avenues being investigated. Thanks, Lauren. I, I think you've actually managed to answer uh, another one of the questions that was on here was whether the, the person see whether a person CAG repeat can increase um, or, or change with increased age or if a person's born with the same CAG repeat. And I think the answer is that a blood test would probably be the same for a person's whole life, but that well, some cells can increase. Yeah, there's so for blood, it, um, it doesn't seem to expand, but there is some research over with lots and lots of people with... Um, that there can they can 
over a larger time for your period may be able to detect a slight change, maybe one or two repeats. Um, but that's kind of very new research that's going and, and will continue to happen, but it needs large numbers of people and their DNA to be screened and things like that. But stuff that Enroll HD can answer um, because everybody that does Enroll HD will get their blood taken or, and DNA that can be used for DNA screen sequencing and things. And we got yeah, I guess like one other um, thing, not necessarily focusing so much on the specific mechanism, but you know, just from a clinical standpoint, you know, there's certain things that we know that help um, in terms of preventing, you know, kind of deterioration to some extent. Not that we're changing what's happening, you know, at a biological level, but we know things like exercise, for example, um, that patients that are, you know, have a good exercise regime, they progress not as fast as others. We also know that there's certain things that are harmful and can speed up. Um, you know, kind of some, or worse than some of the symptoms, so things like drugs, alcohol, smoking. Um, so, you know, in terms of what are the things that, you know, um, people can do in terms of, you know, trying to um, live a healthy lifestyle, maintaining a healthy weight um, is also really important. Um, so those are some of the things that are not necessarily changing the underlying mechanism of the, um, the, the CAG repeat or the Huntington protein itself, but it's helping and at a cellular level in other sort of aspects that it could be a little bit protective, which also adds into another aspect of it is that, you know, gene and environment interactions, you know, they have a thing called modifier genes and epigenetics, and, you know, there's other things that could also play a role as well. But in terms as to, you know, what can some people, what can people do, those are the main things that we kind of focus on, having a healthy lifestyle. Thanks, Addis. Um, just to Give, uh, there's lots and lots of questions, um, jumping around a little bit, but I want to give everybody a chance to share their expertise. So this one is for Sarah. Um, and the question is, what is the source for stem cells for your research? And we get a lot of questions at HDSA from folks who really want to contribute to research in lots of different ways. So for example, um, someone who might be undergoing the process of in vitro fertilization might be interested in donating an embryo that is positive for the HD gene, or someone uh, hears about this stem cell research and wants to donate their own skin cells. Are these things possible, and where, do you, where are your sources? These are fantastic questions. Um, I think any scientist would never turn down any sort of tissue if you offer it to them. Uh, so yes, please donate things to us. Uh, but very typically, where we get our cells in the lab, the, the stem cells that we use come from skin cells. Um, there's a newer technique where people are donating blood cells, and people are using those to turn them into to stem cells. But very typically, it's a biopsy. Uh, it used to be taken from the back of the hand, but that actually gets quite a bit of UV exposure. As you can probably imagine, your hands are always out in the sun. And so now they take it from a little spot underneath your arm. Um, those types of studies, from what I understand, can be done at Cedar sinai which is in LA. I don't know if everyone's local to that area. Um, but I think it's something that people could talk to their local neurologist about or their local PCP and try and find some sort of center that might be closer to them. Um, as far as embryos, that's a fantastic question. I actually do not have the answer of where those can be donated because I don't work with embryonic stem cells. Um, but again, I would highly encourage you to reach out to your neurologist and try and find someone because we absolutely, as scientists, would not want that tissue to go to waste or something like that. It's incredibly valuable, and those cells can certainly be used to ask and answer a lot of incredibly relevant questions for HD. This is definitely something that we have thought a lot about at HDSA because uh, we he hear from folks at least a few times a year about this. but. Um, uh, because of you know how cells need to be prepared and um, how the system kind of works, it's uh, it hasn't really been a possibility to have these sorts of biobanks. But it's definitely something that is that is discussed fairly frequently. Um, I have some some clinical trials question, um, and I will start with this one, which we also hear a lot, which is what is the timeline for each phase of a clinical trial and how long does it take for FDA approval, which I know is a very tough question. Um, I will say varies. Um, it really depends on what are the initial outcomes. You know, I think one, so a couple of things. So if there's a medication that's already exists for another indication, 
those are medications that can move faster within the trials um, because we already established that that's a medication that is safe, right? So we know it's safe in another disease, so then the next question is, can we go ahead and just start it with patients with Huntington's? I think within Huntington's, valvenazine um, might be one example, that it was approved for tardive dyskinesia, which is a different voluntary disorder, not, um, or Branaplan, right, correct, um, that they were chatting about earlier for spinal muscular atrophy, right? So these are drugs that were found to be safe for something else, so then now they're moving into using them for HD. In terms of timeline, it's, you know, we're talking about years, right? Um, I wish I could give you a very specific number, but it really varies, and a lot of it has to do, like I said, you know, has it been proven safe before? If it hasn't, then they have start to start up, you know, from scratch. Another aspect is what is it that they're looking at? Um, so as they talked earlier, if they're looking at, at patients that don't have symptoms and waiting to see if they develop symptoms, that could take many years, right, like 10, 20 years. So it really all depends on what is their primary um, target. If it's lowering a protein, then that's something that probably happens quicker um, than, than not. But yeah, I don't have a, a straight answer on that one. Yeah, I can, I can just add to that. Um, you'll notice it as they increase in the phases, they get kind of longer because the phase three is that kind of golden child that needs to show that the efficacy of the drug and show if it's working. But in something like a degenerative disease like Huntington's, you know, to measure if there's a change in someone's clinical symptoms is what, which is usually what we have to use a clinical endpoint to prove a drug is working and the companies will pick whatever that endpoint is before they start doing the trial. Um, but you need at least kind of two years to show a difference in people that, compared to people that don't have the drug to people that do have the drug because there's also this, this thing called the placebo effect, which um, when people get a pill or something, we don't know who has got the active drug or not. Some people get the placebo, which seems like they're getting the drug. Um, um, the placebo effect can cause them to get better because they feel like they're getting medication. It means um, we see this effect up to like six months after people are taking a drug. So you kind of need to go longer to see whether that's not just because they're being seen in the clinical setting, getting all this engagement, which they wouldn't get in their normal clinical care. Thanks, all. Uh, this one may be for Rachel. And the question is, what is the role of healthy Huntington protein? We keep hearing about Huntington, but what does it do? <laughs> Yeah, it's an excellent question and something I've been studying for many years now. Um, yeah, so what we do know is that Huntington is really important. Like if you take it away from a cell, that cell doesn't survive. We know it's really important um, in this process called embryogenesis, which is like the very beginning of development of a human fetus as it grows over time. Um, and then when you look in the literature of Huntington's disease research, nearly any kind of cellular function, you can find a link to the Huntington protein. And that's actually seems really interesting and great, but it also makes it very difficult to untangle exactly what is going on. And some of this is probably false information that was published because some of the early models of Huntington's disease that Sarah told you about, some of the very early ones just weren't very good. And so we had like some you know questionable things being published that we now know are probably not true. Um, but some of it is probably actually that Huntington is this really uh, massive protein that's doing lots of very complicated things. Um, so the Huntington protein is one of the largest proteins that our body makes. And you know our bodies are, are very clever, they're very highly evolved. And so if they're gonna put in a ton of energy to make this enormous protein that's over 3,000 amino acids, um, which is about like 10 to 20 times larger than any other, the average protein in a cell, it's gotta be for a really good reason, right? Um, pinning down exactly what that is at a molecular level is incredibly challenging, but there's lots of really exciting work being done by people all over the world. And now that we have the tools and the ability to make the Huntington protein and to look at it with these microscopes and do all these kind of really cool functional, well, I think they're cool, functional biochemical studies, we're slowly getting closer to understanding what's going on at a molecular level. But Probably the answer is never going to be simple, 
the answer is probably actually it's doing lots and lots of different things. There are some really key proteins in our cells. Another one that I can think of as a comparator is this is protein called P53, which is mutated in a lot of different types of cancer. And it's a very similar protein to Huntington where you can look it up and it does absolutely everything. It's involved in all of these different things. Um, so yeah, so it's, it's probably gonna be very difficult. And so that's why I like to think of Huntington's as a Swiss, Swiss army knife of a protein, very multitasking. Thanks, Rachel. You all had such a, a smooth transition through things that I can't remember who spoke about animal models, but I've got uh, a question here. Um, in studies with animal model systems, have we observed and or studied physical symptoms of HD in these animals? Or is it just observed brain imaging or other types of data? Yeah, no, there's a lot of physical symptoms that are associated with uh, the manipulation. I wouldn't necessarily say they're associated with HD, but we use them as readouts for the disease. So for example, fruit flies. When you give fruit flies Huntington's, um, over time they have trouble climbing. Flies do this thing where they climb away from gravity. It's called negative geotaxis. If you tap them to the bottom of a vial, they continually climb. But Huntington's disease flies lose that ability over time. Um, and this isn't necessarily a chorea-like phenotype, but it is a readout of their central nervous system function. And so we can say that expressing the Huntington protein in those flies is causing them to have functional decline in their central nervous system. Um, there's also other phenotypes that are associated with mice. Uh, it's not necessarily a one-to-one um, -one comparison for chorea or something like that, but there are different motor tasks that you can have the mice perform. So there's one called a rotor rod, and you can really think of it like uh, if you've ever seen a lumberjack trying to run on a log in the water, it kind of looks like that. Um, and it's a, a rotating rod, and you increase the speed, and you measure the amount of time that it takes the mice to fall off. And the longer they stay on, the better they're doing. Um, they also have an assay where they put the mouse at the top of a pole and they measure the amount of time it takes the mouse to descend. Uh, Huntington's mice aren't very good at doing this because they kind of like skid down and they don't really have a good grip on the pole. Um, there's another one called clasping where if you hold a mouse by the tail, very typically what they do is they splay all their limbs out in a, an effort to catch themselves if you're going to drop them. But Huntington's mice kind of clasp all of their limbs together. Um, and so these aren't necessarily a one-to-one -one comparison of what's going on in humans but they are readouts that, what's that, Amber? Not just motor, yeah, right, there's, the world I know, I should not be answering any mouse right questions. The <laughs> <laughs> there are learning and memory. Maybe Amber can talk about learning and memory. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry for jumping in. <laughs> this is Amber Southwell. She, uh, she's been one of the pioneers in studying Huntington lowering in mice. She works at University of Central Florida, Southern Florida, Central Florida. Um, and she's wearing her lab logo right now. <laughs> Turning it over to Amber. <laughs> yes, shameless self-advertising. Um, yes, yeah, so the interesting thing about mice, and this is a, a little bit more difficult in the, the simpler model systems, is that in mice we're able to actually study all three domains of symptoms in Huntington. So we can study the, the kinds of motor phenotypes that Sarah was talking about, but we also are able to look at different types of cognition, like spatial learning, or learning to recognize objects, and we can look at different aspects of um, psychiatric function or psychiatric-like function, so things that, that look at um, anxiety-like behavior or depressive-like behavior, and we say like behavior because, you know, it's not like they're, they're actually speaking with their psychoanalyst and being, being diagnosed, um, we have to infer. Um, but we, uh, we see good, we see pretty good, um, correlation between, for instance, uh, treating a mouse with an antidepressant that works well in people will reduce depressive-like behavior in the mice, so that we, they are actually good models for this thing. Um, so we were able to, in the HD mice model, um, obsessive-compulsive-like behaviors and, and uh, irritability and aggressive-like behaviors. So um, we have uh, a good coverage of the various aspects of Huntington disease. 
Thank you, Amber. I'll also give a plug. You can study learning and memory in FLY. So I, uh, fruit flies are another model system of mine. Uh, and it's super interesting, actually. You create these kind of like PDMS, which is like a type of plastic molds, and you put a scent at the end, and you have this maze that the fly has to run through, and you can measure the amount of time that it takes the fly to do this, and if they lose that ability over time. Flies are fascinating, anyway. <laughs> All scientists have their favorite model system, I think is what we've learned. And there are lots of really great ways to study H. I'm going to, um, since we are coming to the end of our time here, I'm going to pose one more question about biomarkers and another one about clinical trials. Uh, so the question about biomarkers is, are there any biomarkers that could be assessed as an initial signal of efficacy to get a drug to market faster? Well, um, <laughs> I happen to work in this market. Sorry. Um, this is kind of my bread and butter. I've been working on neurofilament light protein since my PhD, which was started in 2016. So um, I'm going to get it tattooed at some <laughs> point. But um, it just is a weirdly, really useful biomarker because um, it tells us about the brain cell health. Um, so it's not specific to Huntington's disease, it's specific to this process of neurodegeneration or brain cell loss. So it's been used in lots of other diseases, um, which there is brain cell health. So one of the more well-known diseases that has um, if, if uh, has drugs that slow that disease or disease modifying is multiple sclerosis. So it's currently been shown um, to do all the great things that we want a biomarker to do that to be able to use it as a, what we call a surrogate endpoint to get drugs approved faster. So it, it increases when they, someone has MS symptoms or have, and with MS they can go into remission and get better, then the neurofilament goes down again. If they relapse, it, gets, it, go, it goes up. If they get worse, if their disease progresses and they get worse, it continues to increase. And the sweet spot with MS is that they have drugs that work and that can slow the disease down or bring them back into remission. So when they use drugs that work, the change in neurofilament correlates with the change in the clinical eff um, effects. So once we have a drug that works in Huntington's disease, my hope is that something like neurofilament could be approved to, if we see that there's a redu reduction in neurofilament sooner or something like that, um, it would suggest that our brain cells are happier than, or that the drug is having an effect on the brain cell health. Um, and this is seen in another disease called um, spinal muscular atrophy, which was a, is a, a, a terrible di uh, neuromuscular disease in children, but um, they have had a, a, a another antisense oligonuclide treatment, but bit different from Huntington's where they're trying to increase the production of a bad protein or a affected protein um, and it's in children. So with that, it was quite dramatic, the change in neurofilm, which you could see, but we're not kind of expecting that here. So long story short, I think, yes, we, we're trying to make that happen. Um, Thanks, Lauren. Um, there's lots and lots of questions. Um, there are a few that we weren't able to get to. I saw there were a couple about observational research, so I'm going to hold off on those because we'll have an observational research session. Um, and there were some sort of more personal ones, so I'm sort of jumping around here to give all of our speakers a chance to talk. But the last one that I'm going to ask is about uh, clinical trials. And the question is, what percentage of phase two participants need to have a positive effect being on a drug in a trial in order to advance to phase three. And so I think that the, the question is really about how do trials measure the success and when do you decide that a drug is ready to move to another phase? I feel like I've gotten the hardest, you know, of the questions that are, yeah. And I mean, to, to, to be fair, I mean, well, that's true, actually. Yeah, the Huntington protein, that was uh, probably also up there. <laughs> um, so it really depends, that's the thing. And I know it's an unsatisfying answer, but that's the truth. It depends on what each trial specifies beforehand. So some trials may say, you know, we want to lower hunting, the mutant Huntington protein by, you know, 60%. And if it's 60%, they consider that a positive trial, for example. There could be another trial that said, uh, actually, we want all of it down by you know, 50% or 80%. So a lot of it is depending on the trial itself. 
and how is it that they pre-specified before they start doing the study. Um, and then it could also be motor symptoms. Um, so it could be, you know, um, Lauren was sharing about the UHDRS, which is this, um, the scale that is used when you, you know, patients with Huntington's see the neurologist that do a whole neurological exam. Sometimes it may be that they want a decrease, you know, in the UHDRS of, I don't know, it depends. It could be anywhere between like, you know, lower 10, 20% or over time seeing that there's not a quick decline. So it really depends. It could be a percentage um, of, a, you know, biomarker being lower. It could be a clinical outcome. Um, it could be a percentage of, you know, improvement or it could be kind of just looking over time. So it really depends on the trial and what they're looking for. So sorry, not the most satisfying, but I think you answered that tough question well. And I did promise that I would try and pose questions that you all knew the answers to. But you all know the answers to well, many yeah. of these questions, except for the really great ones that scientists are asking. Yeah. Um, and the next session in this room is going to be Ask the Scientist Anything. So we can continue to uh, answer all these questions. But let's give a, a, a round of applause to our four speakers. Thank you all for attending this Research 101 session and thanks to our speakers for making it so clear. <laughs>